Hi, this is SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. I posted on Instagram and Facebook about my stash of vintage synthesizers that I can make ready for sale, and I found a taker for this very lovely Roland Jupiter 4. I got this a few years ago, and my memory of what the guy said when I bought it was that it was working fine until one day it just completely died. So in this video, we'll crack it open, take a look around inside, and get it operational. First, let's make sure this is really dead. I've had people bring me synthesizers that were supposedly broken, but were actually working fine. So let's power this on. I hear a little thump, and uh, some LEDs lit up. So this isn't completely dead, but there's no output, either in manual mode or on, on presets. So, so yeah, th essentially this is uh, non-functioning. So let's open it up and see what this is made of. To get inside, there are four screws that we'll need to remove from the panel here, and then the top panel will just fold open. This one is missing two of the screws. Here in the bottom we have our big honkin' power transformer next to a simple little power supply. Next to it we've got the main motherboard. Mounted to the motherboard is this rack here with our four voice cards and an extra card in front that I'll get back to shortly. The job of the motherboard is to scan all the switches and pots on the synth and from that generate control voltages and control signals for the voice cards. This is where the Comptuphonic aspect that they boast on the, the lid comes from. In your basic non-microprocessor controlled synthesizer like a Mini Moog, the pots and switches are mingled in there with the audio path circuitry. So you rotate the frequency knob on a mini Moog and you're directly increasing or decreasing the control voltage going into an oscillator. Direct and simple. But your patch memory consists of scribbling down your patch on a piece of paper. In your late 1970s microprocessor controlled synthesizer, like the Prophet 5, OBX, or this Jupiter 4, your switches and pots aren't directly connected to the audio generating circuits. The pots are just set up as voltage dividers, say 0 volts to 5 volts, and you've got an analog to digital converter that converts that voltage to a string of bits that represents the value of that voltage. The CPU can store that in memory, and when it's time to route it to the appropriate analog circuitry, it converts it back to an analog voltage using a digital to analog converter. There are specialized chips that do analog to digital conversion and vice versa, but here in the Jupiter 4 they've actually built their own crude DAC and ADC with some resistors, OR gates, and a couple of op amps. On this board we've got our CPU, which is an Intel 8048, which has onboard mask ROM, and we've got our memory chip, a 5101, that gets backed up by a battery. So I mentioned we have our four voice cards here. Each voice card has a VCO, a VCF, VCA, and two ADSR envelope generators. There's also a sub-oscillator, or frequency divider, for the main VCO. They put the trimmers for calibrating these at the top, since you can't access the front or back of these circuit boards while they're inserted into their slot on the motherboard. This fifth board in front of the four voice cards is what they call the module controller. It's more like the module modulation controller, as it controls the modulation of everything on the voice cards. VCO CV, pulse width, filter, etc. There's a white noise source on here, and a sample and hold circuit, and a bunch of more fun stuff. Off to the right of the motherboard is this key assigner board. This is another microprocessor controlled board that's completely independent of the previous board. In your Minimoog or your ARP Odyssey or similar synthesizer, under your key bed you've got a chain of resistors that are being fed a constant current, so there's even voltage steps along that chain. Specifically one volt per octave or one one twelfth volt per step. You press a key and the voltage at that point in the chain is routed directly into your oscillator as the keyboard control voltage. So in your ultra high tech, more modern, late 1970s computer control designs, the keyboard is a switch matrix, and we've covered switch matrices in a previous video, and it's scanned by a microprocessor, and the CPU determines which key or keys will sound based on how the manufacturer coded it to work. So this is that board for the Jupiter 4. 
It scans the keybed and generates a control voltage and a gate signal for each of the four voices. Here they also implemented a digital to analog converter from scratch, but used a different approach than on the other board. This board also uses an 8048 microprocessor with its code stored on it in MaskROM. Then there's some other stuff we can't see too well right now from our vantage point. We've got a few control panel boards that have the pots, sliders, and switches. There's these three on the top panel, and there's also one for the bender assembly here. If we were to remove the bender assembly, underneath that there would be another circuit board, the Chorus Ensemble circuit board, and the dreaded NICAD battery. There's also a couple panel boards in the front here, under the keybed, for the push button switches. While not many of my videos have been on Japanese synthesizers, I do love working on them. They're engineered very professionally. They're usually laid out well to be easily serviceable, and they have good technical documentation accompanying them. It's no wonder these companies are still in business today. Compare the inside of this Jupiter 4 with the inside of a memory Moog or an Arc Quadra. All right, show and tell time is over. Let's get serious now and get down to fixing this. We're going to start with the basics, and if necessary, we'll explore deeper and deeper as we go along. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to check the power supply voltages. The power supply is here, and the connections leading downstream to the other circuit boards are, are right here. Uh, it may be hard to see, in fact, I pretty much guarantee you won't see it, but down there between those connectors, they're even labeled for us on the board of what, what voltage rail is, is on what pin. So let's, uh, let's check them here. So checking the 5 volt rail, we've got 5.017 volts, which is fine. Check the 15 volt rail, we're at 14.85 volts, which is fine. And the minus 15 volt rail, we're at minus 15.09. All good. So for the next step, I want to check to see if the two microprocessors are actually running. We've done a few videos in the past where we found the lights are on but nobody's home due to a CPU that's not running. One of them was even one of these 8048 microprocessors that had failed in an ARP Quadra. So let's start with the key assigner board. The microprocessor needs three things to run. It needs power. So our VCC is here on pin 40. And it's 5 volts. So the second thing we need is for the reset signal to be a logic level high, or 5 volts. This line is called reset with a little line over it, which means not reset. So a zero volt means that it's in the reset state and not running. And a five volt means that it's not reset and therefore able to run. This line is typically held low for a short amount of time at power up to give all the chips attached to the microprocessor a chance to get powered up and ready to go before the processor starts executing instructions and potentially using chips that aren't ready. So this line's on pin 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it's 5 volts as expected. And we can see here, I'll turn the keyboard off and it goes back down to 0 volts. We'll see when we turn it on, you see how it just kind of slowly goes up to 5 volts to give those other chips a chance to get ready. So the third thing we need is a clock signal. So there's no internal clock on this microprocessor like there are in modern microcontrollers. And without being clocked, this will never execute any instructions. But they do have the framework for a clock built in. So on this microprocessor, they have you connecting a crystal across two pins instead of feeding in a, a clock signal to a single pin. So we're going to look at that, the two crystal pins, pin 2, Two. Scope's not really triggering on that, but it's there. And pin three. Again, we can see that something is there. Something high frequency is there. Um, so, because this is just a crystal, uh, it's kind of hard to tell to see if the thing is actually being clocked. Unfortunately, on this microprocessor, there's a line called ALE, and it's on pin 11. And this toggles as the CPU executes instructions. So let me count this down. Uh, we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So here's pin 11. 
And there on pin 11, we see that toggling. So the CPU is being clocked and appears to be executing instructions. So this CPU is running. And we'll do the same thing now on the main motherboard's microprocessor. So we're gonna go to pin 40 and verify power. We've got five volts. We're gonna check the reset line, pin four. We're good, five volts. And we'll go down five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. The ALE line is uh, toggling, so this is uh, being clocked and it's executing instructions. So both microprocessors are running. So the basics have checked out okay. We've got good power, and both microprocessors are running. Let's work this problem in from both sides and check closer to the output. In fact, we're going to look at what's called the total output, which is the sum of the four voice cards. The four voice cards audio output is summed and buffered by this op amp down here, IC30. But the input pins are on the opposite side of the chip, blocked by the module controller card. So I can't probe them. So we're just gonna look at the total audio output uh, coming off the motherboard, the main board, uh, through this connector, A28. Uh, that goes off to the chorus ensemble board before going to the audio output jack. So we'll be able to narrow the problem down to that board or eliminate it as, as a suspect. So let's probe that output pin here and hit some keys and I'm not seeing anything. Ideally I'd like to check, I'd much rather check the input of that op amp which would show me if any sounds coming from any of the voice cards. But these voice cards are the exception to the thing that I mentioned earlier about how the Japanese synths were neatly laid out and easily serviceable and I really don't want to have to pull one of the voice cards out right now. So let's go back upstream and work our way down again. Without probing the voice cards themselves, we can see if they're being sent the proper control voltages and signals. Since it's simpler, we're going to check the key assigner board first. We want to see if we're getting keyboard control voltages and gate signals when we press keys. With no gates, we won't have any sound. So there's a connector here, D4, where the gates and control voltages for each of the voices are sent to the motherboard. Let's probe those pins and hit some keys. So pin uh, 1 to 4 is where we should have our gates. So look at that. There's a gate there. There's a gate there. There's a gate there, and there's a gate there. So the gate, gates are good. So on pins 7 to 10, we should have our keyboard control voltages. So I'm going to start at pin 10 here. We'll hit a high key, and we've got about a 4 or 5 volt control voltage. Hit a low key, we're down to 0 volts. Let's go to the next one. Same deal. Last one. Yeah, so it looks like the key assigner board appears to be functioning. On the main motherboard, let's do some equivalent checks. We want to see if this board's generating the control voltages, like for envelope amplitudes and filter cutoff frequencies and all those other good things that we need to get sound from the synthesizer. The schematic has a few drawings of what waveforms we should expect to see at the different test points. So let's start with CP7. Uh, CP stands for checkpoint, same thing as test point. Get my magnifying glass here. So for checkpoint 7, this is what the service manual shows us that we should see. And this is what we do see on the scope. So for checkpoint 8, this is what the service manual shows that we should be seeing. And this is what we do see. So this one looks pretty good. This is what checkpoint 9 should look like per the service manual. And this is what it looks like on the scope. It looks pretty similar. Uh, checkpoint 10 should look like this. And it looks like this. It looks pretty good. This appears to be the multiplexed voltage values from some of the different pots on the panel. Uh, service manual says checkpoint 11 should look like this, and this is what it looks like. 
And checkpoint 12 should look like this. And this is what we see on the scope, so it's looking good. And checkpoint 13 should look like this on the oscilloscope. And this is what it looks like. So, so this one um, doesn't quite look like the drawing. And the amplitude seems really low. The drawing doesn't give the range of the amplitude we should expect. But this test points the output of the DAC. So I'd expect to see stuff in the range of 0 volts to 5 volts. So I know I've got sustained turn to maximum on my ADSR. So what we're seeing here, we've got a maximum voltage of about 720 millivolts. And that seems pretty low. Uh, this op amp chip is configured just as a buffer. But let's uh, confirm that, that what we're seeing here on the output matches the input. So input is pin 2. And yeah, the input is the, the same. It's low there too. So that makes me think that there's a problem with the, da the DAC. So like I mentioned before, they didn't use a DAC chip, but they built one themselves. So here we've got the microprocessor that's spinning out six bits of digital data. It looks like eight bits, but actually the lowest two bits aren't being used. These data bits get latched into these 74 LS175 flip-flops. And then through the 4001 NOR gates, they each contribute their applicable portion of the voltage to the total. So let's look at the output of each of these NOR gates. Uh, we'll start at the least significant bit uh, on IC9, and we'll work our way up. So the first bit that's actually used is here uh, on IC9 pin 11. So this is the, the, the least significant bit bit number 6 um, on IC9 pin 11 and we see uh, that there's a, that there's data coming out of that. So let's look at the most significant bit on uh, IC10 or we'll look at the same pin on IC10 and there's nothing coming out of it. So let's take a look here um, at some of the other outputs of this IC10 there's nothing coming out there on the most significant bit, second bit, uh, third bit, fourth bit. So there's nothing coming out of this uh, OR gate. So let's see, uh, let's check the inputs. So first, let's go back to IC9 and see what the uh, inputs look like on a working one. So we'll go back to that bit. Six. So the inputs are on uh, pin 13 and pin 12, and that's the output. So this is just configured as a, like an inverter. Um, so let's take a look at the uh, inputs on um, uh, one of the, the gates on, on pin on IC10. So we'll go to pin 1. So this is high. It's not toggling. Pin 2 is the same and pin 3 is low. So, uh, I mean, it is inverting it, but we're not getting um, inputs to IC10. So the inputs look bad. So let's take a step back now and look at the flip-flops coming off of the CPU. IC8 latches the least significant bits. So let's look at uh, the least significant bit that's being used, uh, bit 6, pin 7. Two, four, six, seven. So seven is the output. And pin five is the input. So this is what a working one looks like. Let's look at the, uh, the flip-flop for the four most significant bits. So that's uh, IC7. So we're going to look at pin, uh, pin seven here. So it's just high. We'll look at what the input is to that is, and there is, there is an input coming there from the CPU. This flip-flop chip uses the same clock as IC8 next to it, so I think we found our problem. It looks like that flip-flop IC7 is bad. It, it's conceivably possible, but very unlikely, that the inputs to the NOR gate chip, all four of them have shorted and it's pulling those lines high. 
It seems very unlikely, but I'm going to check with another tool that I have to confirm which chip is bad, the NOR gate or the flip-flop. So yeah, it definitely looks like it's the flip-flop that's bad and not the NOR gate. So at this point, we're going to pull the motherboard out and replace that chip. And while I have the board out, I'm going to use it as an opportunity to replace these purple Matsushita capacitors. All of those purple caps throughout the synthesizer will need to go before I'm finished with it. They're notorious for leaking electrolyte. So I've got the board out, and uh, there's a few things that I'm noticing now that I, I couldn't notice when the board was in. First of all, this connector here, you see the green corrosion. This is the connector for the NICAD battery. Now the NICAD battery is stored in a place where if it leaks it doesn't really do any harm to anything. Uh, but you can see that the corrosion from the battery managed to creep up the wire and, uh, and corrode this connector here. So this connector is coming off and uh, will be replaced or, or I have another idea which I'll uh, come back to in a bit. But uh, take a look at these purple Matsushita capacitors. I'm going to cut one off and take it over to the uh, microscope to give you a better look. Actually, I don't even need to take it to the microscope. You can see it pretty clearly here. Uh, you can see the corrosion from the leaked electrolyte that's coming down the legs of the capacitor. This will eventually make it to the traces of the circuit board and eat those away. Like ARPs with their exploding tantalum capacitors, consider the purple Matsushita capacitors in the Japanese synths a mandatory recap job if you value your gear. This is the battery connector from the bottom side of the board, and you can see that the corrosion has uh, started creeping up this trace. It looks like we caught it when it's only like a centimeter into the trace, so we'll repair that as well. Here you can see the pad uh, for the connector for the battery, that the one that had the most corrosion just totally disintegrated when I tried to desolder it. And even though the board is still coated with it from when it was manufactured, we're going to clean off the fluxy residues left uh, from removing that flip-flop chip. You know, that actually is not a bad band name, fluxy residues. Feel free to use it. Invite me to your gig if you, if you hit it big. And uh, I'm testing that flip-flop chip here in an IC tester, and it's bad, just like we expected. So we'll install an IC socket and a new chip and uh, change those capacitors, and then we'll put this board back in and see where we stand. So I put the board back, and uh, let's give it a shot. Woo, it works. Let's, uh, let's check some other stuff. That's just an uninitialized preset. Sounds pretty cool for random data. It does sound like one of the voices is out. Number two. There's more that's gonna to need to be done before this Jupiter 4 is ready for its new home. We've gotta deal with the battery uh, we've got to repair the one voice that appears to be out. We've got to recap the power supply and replace all the rest of the Lilac Matsushita capacitors. We've got to make sure all the rest of the functionality is working. We've got sliders, pots, and switches that need to be cleaned. And we've got to calibrate it. But we totally accomplished what I was hoping to achieve today in this video. We got a look around inside the Jupiter 4, and we repaired this broken synth to make it operational again. If I come across any other interesting problems as I'm working on this Jupiter 4, I may make another video. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Synth Chaser.